Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tony Pellegrino, and this is part of a live tech talk that we do every Tuesday and Thursday. Today being Thursday, September 23rd. Thanks for joining us. Um, we've got a lot of good stuff. We're going to continue our whole terminology series. This is part four, and um, we are going to turn you guys and gals into experts before the end of this series is over. Um, as always, we welcome your questions and comments. So go ahead and type them in. I've got Debbie, Alex, and Jamie here to help me today. So type them in. Debbie or Jamie will read them back off, and I'll try and answer your questions. Um, we're, we're not going to do a featured product today. Um, it would be the YJ Hood Louver. I still have a handful left. So those are available on the website for 99 if you're interested. Um, Tuesday, here's where we left off. We were talking about we had just gotten into suspension, specifically front suspension. Um, what I want to do now is I'd actually like to move from here over to here. Can we do that, Alex? And I'm going to set this up. So um, here's a typical guy who has obviously spent some money on his Jeep. Um, he's got aftermarket axles, coilovers. Um, I'm not going to mention whose suspension this is, I'll let you use your imagination. Uh, the reason I'm talking to you about this first is because I want you to see how this works, and then I'm going to show you how a Genrite suspension works. So let's take a look here. Um, so by the way, this is typical of my experience, right? The guy cannot stick his line to save his life. Um, this is what I call driving by braille, by the way. Um, just beating the daylights out of his suspension. Finally, he manages to get over and gets completely stuck. This is typical of a suspension that will not hold the line. You saw the, that rock just slip under uh, the rear axle, and now he's beating the daylights out of his uh, rear drive shaft. So um, as a driver, this is a really tough situation because um, you're in there going, well, I spent all the money. Why isn't my Jeep going through here? So, um, yeah, a little bit, little bit frustrating. Okay, uh, how do I get to the other video? Just over one. Down. Down. Over, down. So if I hit pause, let's let's pause this. Now over? Yeah. Which way? This one? Next? Or go hit back to the go forward. Go forward. Down. <clears throat> oh, no. No. Here, I'm gonna let one of the experts try it here. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, this will be worth it. Hang, right, hang tight. The expert. <laughs> there we go. All right, we're back to it. Okay, so this is uh, Andrew's tracer that was recently built. You can see he's even at more of an angle on the hill. Most of you would pucker pretty hard even doing that. Um, you can also watch how the rear suspension grabs the rock and climbs over it. So we're going to let this play again because I want you to see how, and by the way, if you're not familiar, this is how the suspension should work. You want the tire to climb, right? This tire stays on the ground. It climbs up over the rock, just like it should. Suspension does its work, articulating. And then the rear tire grabs the rock and lets the Jeep get up over, okay? So the other Jeep, that was not happening, right? The, the, the thing was bumping into the rock and both tires were climbing. So um, big, big difference, okay? So let's come back over here. So we talked a little bit about um, the way we do ours with the three link versus the factory four link and how that has a lot of inherent bind built into it. Okay, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to kind of clip through this, Deb, if you or Jamie have questions come yep. up, just None yet. let me know. You're good. Okay, um, we talked about this is 
you know, basically the way the factory suspension looks. And when left at a very low ride height where the arms are flat, um, this suspension can perform just fine. However, you don't have a lot of ground clearance, right? It's the reason why everybody puts a lift kit in. Okay, so you heard me talk about, and this is a great example of the video we were just watching, where the passenger side tire will just climb up. This three link front suspension design um, has no bind. And all of these joints, which are you know, the Johnny joints that we use, right, are a really high quality, have a long range of motion, and uh, that's what you've got all throughout the suspension. So this is what makes it work really, really good. Um, in addition to that, we've spent a lot of time matching all the spring rates and the valving to balance the Jeep. We've moved everything outboard as far as we can get it to give it a positive, predictable feel. Um, again, there's a lot more to it than just taking coilovers and bolting them onto a Jeep, a lot more. Okay, so what we're trying to show you is um, this balance that has to be achieved on the whole vehicle, uh, front to rear, left to right. Okay, any questions so far? Uh, yes, one uh, off topic question, two questions. Okay. Um, the first is, uh, Barath Bouchon Sarij. Hi, Tony. In your previous Tech Talk, you mentioned not to install the aluminum tie rod and track bar, but how about a 7075 aluminum as it's used for control arms? Thank you. Um, great question. Your downside is you cannot weld the ram assist tabs to it. So that immediately eliminates it. You cannot weld to 7075. And you know how I feel about those clamps. That's a no-no, do not do that, all right? So just use chromoly. It's what you'll find on every single Gen Ride Jeep. It's what we make the steering out of. It's thick wall, it works. By the way, if it does manage to get bent, you can bend it back. Um, if there was something better, I'd be running it, okay? Another one? Second question. Um... David Mork, what tires are on the Jeep with the tracer lift? Uh, those are the new Mickey Thompson Baja Boss DOT version. So that's Andrew's daily driver. He just runs the regular tire. That's the same tire that I'm running on the Aftershock. And um, I've tried both the DOT and the Sticky. Um, I can tell you there's very, very little difference. Um, and for the longer wear characteristics, the DOT is a a great way to go. So from my own experience, yeah. Dennis Sargent, what's inside the Johnny Join and what makes it the go-to? Ah, there's a good question. So um, years ago, Curry figured this whole thing out. So this is a forged chromoly housing and um, what they perfected is the durometer of the two halves. I don't think I have one of these out here split apart. Um, but there's two halves that uh, capture this ball that's in the middle that allows this to pivot. And um, then they preload it with this big washer and a snap ring. So the other side is solid and this side has the snap ring. Um, this setup is really nice. You can see that it's lubable and this quietly rotates in here. Um, if you go to something more like this, right? If you go to a Heim, what happens is, is this is a metal to metal kind of an arrangement. So you're transferring all the noise. This with the uh, special durometer urethane inside here, it isolates the metal ball from the outside of the metal housing. And that really keeps it quiet. It has a, I think it's a 30 degree range of motion. It's, it's more than we can use. So you're nowhere near um, exceeding the range of motion on this joint. So um, really, really a nice quality product. And we've sold thousands of these things. They come in every single Genrite suspension. So, yep. More questions, Deb? And, uh, another off topic, but why don't you go ahead and keep going. Keep going, going. We'll, okay. We'll save that for later. Okay. All right. So here's another view. I know it's a little bit hard to see when the drive shaft's in because the upper link and the drive shaft run parallel to each other. And um, 
This is the whole setup. So you see the three links plus the track bar right here. And um, that's how the front suspension works so well is it's bind free and really moves well with what you're trying to do. This is considered a long or, um, you know, yeah, long arm is probably the best terminology. Um, and you can see all the brackets are heavy duty. Um, in this case, it has the built-in landing pads. This, what we're looking at here is happens to be one of our legend suspensions, but it's exactly the same on the Tracer and the uh, Elite and the EXS for that matter. Any questions on this, Deb, with the uh, three link? Not, not yet. Okay. All right, we're gonna keep going. Here's, um, so this is Jeff Perkins, Banshee TJ. This has the new TJ Tracer suspension on it. And you can see it on the articulation ramp. One of the things that I want you to notice is, look at how straight the rear wheel's going. Most of the time, when other people's suspensions articulate, the wheels, that rear axle starts walking. And that's what makes it hard for you to stay on your line. So um, I was looking for another picture, but this was a good example of, uh, you know, how much flex we get out of one of our Jeeps with all the tires on the ground. And that's a great example. The next one I'm gonna show you is Jamie's Growler. And uh, again, rear tire going straight with the body and you can see how much articulation. And by the way, everyone, those are just 14 inch shocks. Okay, so that's, a, you could fit a whole nother 40 inside here. That's a massive amount of travel. And this is, uh, James, did they tell you what this ramped? Was it like 1100 or something? It was over a thousand, right? Yeah, I think it was like just over a thousand. So, was a little more. okay. So um, we've talked about that on the show about um, being able to articulate in that RTI thousand uh, category. This is more than enough to take you anywhere you want to go off road and yet still be drivable on the street. So, and you can see even at full articulation, look at the angle of this front arm. It's, it's just a little bit below parallel. So even if you were to hit another rock or obstacle, that wheel's gonna climb and uh, the suspension will work perfect. Okay, any questions on this either side? No. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. All right, now let's talk rear suspension. So the first one we're gonna show you here is what's called a double triangulated rear suspension. Um, there typically is no two that are alike. Um, the lower links can be anywhere from, you know, right here in the middle to spaced out just a little bit um, to a, a achieve that triangulation on the bottom. And the upper links, you can see them come together on top of the differential. Um, sometimes this can be achieved with what they call a Y link where there's one joint on top of the differential. Um, I like the redundancy of two joints on top of the differential. Okay, so that those joints take a beating and uh, especially when you're on the gas or hopping or under heavy braking, um, that's really trying to torque this rear axle. So you want as much control as you can have on there. And again, the Johnny joints do a great job of dampening all that shock load, but still giving you a positive feel behind the wheel. So we're gonna show you a couple more angles of this. Here's a, another good angle. And uh, this happens to be one of our elite suspensions. So you can see how the two V's oppose each other. And that's what keeps the rear axle in place. And uh, by the way, that's fully adjustable. So you can, you know, adjust it more left, more right, a little bit more forward, a little bit more back. Um, you have a crazy amount of adjustment there. And uh, this is, um, actually, this is the EXS. I just noticed this is the EXS here. So, but a great view of uh, what that double triangulation looks like. And you can see how we've buried, you know, all of these nodes together that we talked about that on cages, how all those points come together. So you've got lots of support to hold that rear axle in there. You know, keep in mind guys, that's, that's a good like four feet away, right? So that's a ton of leverage that that rear axle, when you think about sliding around a corner um, the amount of force that that's putting on that rear axle 
Um, this is why I like having two joints up here. Um, really, really quite important. Okay. More questions, Deb? Uh, yeah, Mark Lawrence, with the LJ Legend lift, will I be able to move the front end forward like the tracer kit? Um, and what Pitman arm? Okay, great question. Um, the, the Legend is what we call a builder's kit. So what you can do is actually push your axle forward to maximize it with the steering. And do we still have a... I guess we don't have a pitman arm, a twisted pitman arm out here, but you need to use our twisted pitman arm because that allows the um, drag leg and, and tie rod to swap sides. So, um, and that, depending on what Jeep you're doing, if it's like a YJ, you can go four inches. If it's a TJ, you can go five inches forward. Um, it does require um, a body lift and an engine lift as well because it helps to move the radiator and everything up out of the way you're going to have a lot more um, up travel so you need to make sure that everything unclear as you're cycling the steering so um you like i say you can move that you don't have to move the front axle forward it's only if you want to but um if you're go, taking the time to convert it over i think you're going to want to move that far as far forward as you can get it so and different axles um, you know, what you're going to have to do because that's a builder's kit is you've got to cycle it. Let me go back a couple pictures and I'll show you to this one. Okay. So what happens is, is you've got your track bar up in front. You've got this upper link. You're going to have your drive shaft. You've got your engine and you've got to cycle this whole thing up and down. A lot of the time what we do is we take the springs off and just let the whole suspension move. You got to make sure that the edge of the skid plate isn't getting into the differential, that the drive shaft's not rubbing on anything through its cycle. And then you've got to cycle it left and right and turn the wheels left and right before you can be 100% confident that everything's going to clear. So typically what we do is we make up mock-up links. So, or you could just tack these together and then be able to adjust them. But I've, I've even seen people make them out of PVC pipe right? So that you can try this and cycle this whole thing um, to make sure you're getting the most out of it and then build your links. Okay. So again, the, the do it yourself kit gives you a ton of flexibility because we don't tell you what axle you have to have. You can run anything you want and, um, but it's a hundred percent up to you to make sure it all clears. Okay. So uh, can you describe to Tammy Fisher what we do to cover the rear tower holes in the Elite? Oh, sure. Um, we don't have any pictures of it on here, but um, what happens is, is the, the towers, let me get over to that picture. Only a portion of the tower, the, I know this looks really big, but part of it is camera angle. But, you know, the, the Jeep body sits about here. So only a piece of this comes through the actual inner fender well. Then we've got a two layer waterproof uh, cover that matches the interior. It's got the same texture as the interior plastic um, that goes over this. This cover um, dampens the sound, keeps the dust, the, the dirt, the water out. And um, I've got them on Terramoto. I've got them on uh, our Aftershock. Works great. The, the reason that we don't do a hard cover Hard covers transfer noise, and um, they're, you can't get them off. If you need to service the shocks, this is how you get to the bolt. So you've, you've got to, you can't just seal this thing up unless you're willing to pull the body off next time you want to service the shocks. So good question. What else you got? Uh, Kevin Hudson asked, is the tracer system the same as Elite in regards to things only go in one way and everything is preset? So... Um, over the years with the legend kit so let's let's back up to the the diy kit that i was just talking about where guys were calling i want to use a nine inch a 14 bolt a sterling I, you know they're all over the map but whatever rear end they stole out of something um that that was perfect right the legend kit let people stretch it um, we offered a five seven and nine inch package which basically was dictated on the gas tank 
what happened was is a lot of people said, I don't want to spend the time doing all that cycling. Can you just tell me how long to make the links and where to put them and blah, blah, blah. Well, that's when we came out with the other two kits. So the other two kits, you get zero flexibility. I mean, none. That means you got to run curry axles. You got to run the lengths and put everything on the frame where we say, and they're, it's easy. They're located by holes in the frame or other features in the frame. It's super easy to do it. And uh, it, it takes all the guesswork out. And in a very short amount of time, you've got yourself the, the next best thing to a full on buggy, but with a Jeep body. So by the way, this, this entire suspension you're looking at here that, or that I've been showing you, these are exactly the same. If you were building a off-road buggy, whether it's a crawler or a competition buggy, this is exactly what the suspension is going to look like. So um, we've optimized everything to fit it under the body on a Jeep and uh, really taken everything into consideration to give you the best possible travel, the best possible handling both on and off-road. So um, very, very important. And guys, um, keep in mind, you know, the, the elite system, well, the, the, the legend was developed a long, long, long time ago. The elite system was developed in 2009 and, uh, this, the EXS is even the next best thing from that. So, um, Alex was nice enough to bring me in a couple of things. So here's the kind of templates that we have where you literally hold this on the frame. You just match up the holes and that's exactly where the bracket goes. So um, these are, they're nice. They're laser cut out of steel, but they're throwaways. Once you've got it on there, that's the last time you use it and you're good to go. Okay. More questions? Uh, Jamie, do you have any YouTube questions? No. Doing okay. Okay, All I've right. got one off. Keep off firing them in, guys. Yeah. Guys and gals, yeah, yeah. I'll cover the off topic. Uh, Tyler Hagen, um, he said, hey, Tony, I've got an 05 TJ Sport 4.5 inch Rubicon Express long arm lift. His wheels are 3.75 backspace. I was rubbing on the lower control arm, so I put in 1.25 wheel spacers. So if I did four or greater backspace, would I still be rubbing or should I be looking for a different lift? He's trying to achieve optimal scrub radius that you just Okay, so um, excellent. Thanks for writing in. Um, you've actually gone the opposite direction. So um, by having a 3.5 inch wheel and adding another spacer behind that, you've actually spaced it out even more. So where you're saying you want to go to a four inch backspace, that's going to move it closer to the control arm. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, one is, I'd like to know how much it was rubbing the control arm. If it rubs a little, I don't care. Let it rub. Okay, the tire is typically aired down and it's gonna just bop out of the way by itself. The control arm's round, it doesn't really matter. Okay, now if it's rubbing enough where it's stopping the vehicle, then that's a different situation, okay? Um, the other thing you could do is to get more backspace like you want to optimize the scrub radius, you've gotta go with a wider axle housing. Okay, then you can put the deeper. That's why a couple shows ago we were showing you that we go with those 70 inch wide axles. That's how we're doing it. We're, we're getting the axle wider, we push the wheel in over it. By the way, this is the way it's done on every single car made today. They figured out a long time ago that this scrub radius made a huge deal. So whether you're driving a Mercedes, a, a Porsche, a BMW, like this is, if you look at the wheels, they're almost virtually flat with the outside. They're trying to push everything in. They want the drive line as long as possible. Get all the joints, everything out as far as they can because it maximizes the geometry on the vehicle. Okay, so good question, but um, right now you're going backwards. You're, you're actually increasing your scrub uh, by putting a spacer back there. Okay. What else you got, Deb? That's it. Go ahead. Right now, Jamie, you're okay on your side? Good. Okay. All right. So we looked at the, the double triangulated, right? Here's, this is, now this is tricky. This is single triangulated. Okay. So now just the uppers are triangulated and the lowers are almost straight. 
okay? So um, this is typical for our legend or our tracer. This one happens to be a picture of a tracer. Um, still the same aluminum links, still the same Johnny joints, still the same rear axle. Everything's exactly the same. So I'm gonna go back to the other picture so you can try and see the difference, right? See how these inners are pulled in more than where the other picture I just showed you were almost um, even with the frame. We're gonna go back. I know the angle's a little bit different, but you can see how these are so far out now, okay? So there's nothing wrong with single triangulation. Um, what this does is it actually provides a little bit more resistance to the chassis. So it's not quite as likely to um, articulate on its own. When you do the double triangulated, this is bind free. This is completely, I mean, if, if you have nothing on here, you could literally take the axle and just move it by hand. It's that easy and smooth, okay? Now the disadvantage of that is on short wheelbases like we've had in the past, you know, back when it was, your, your Jeep was 93 inches, this was really squirrely and only used for serious rock crawling. Today, the, the chassis are much longer now. We're at 118 inch wheelbase and um, this, you don't feel it like you did before on the shorter wheelbase. So that's what we're able to put just on our standard production uh, chassis now. So any questions? Yep. Terry Runyon, 2018 JKU. What am I giving up if I go with your DIY rear shock towers compared to using your elite cross member and, shock and towers? Got a quote from Jeff a while back to do rear four link, but using non-elite shock towers. We'll hopefully pull the trigger on it in winter or spring. Already have your 20 gallon gas tank installed. Okay. Um, so our... Um, universal shock towers look much more like this, like they do on the tracer. These do not cut all the way through the frame, okay? So it's a more shallow tower. Now, depending on the width of the axle, depending on the backspace on the wheel, um, would depend on whether you can use these with the, the, the size shock that you want. Remember, we make these towers to fit a two inch, two and a half, and a three inch shock. So it's quite a wide variety, but you have to have enough space between the outside of the shock, the coil, and the inside of the tire, because when it articulates, it's gonna come up and hit the shock. Okay, so um, really that's what it's all about. The, the actual design of the tower, exactly the same. The, the, that's, that's fine. Now, if we're talking JK, the JK, or JL for that matter, comes with a whole nother cross member, okay? Because what's happening here is these towers are very tall and in the middle of the factory frame, there's not enough support to um, support such a tall tower, right? Basically, you're over leveraging it. And nobody wants to put a crossbar between these and lose their cargo area behind the back seat. So um, that's, that's always the challenge. If, if you were willing to do that, Man, you can do whatever you want. Some people don't even build towers like this. They just punch holes and tie it to the roll cage. Okay, so there's a lot of ways to go, but this has become the kind of the industry standard or our standard. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. Okay. Uh, what else we got? More? Okay. Debbie's good. Okay, so single triangulated. Okay, so here's, again, what, what I was trying to do was say, all right, we've talked about the concepts, now let's look at what it looks like on the trail. Okay, so here's, um, everybody knows this is the golden crack um, in Moab. Um, this is a popular photo spot. It's very flexed out, so the front tire is buried, rear tire is buried, and you go through this um, crack, right? And um, this is a great spot to test your articulation. It also gives you a feel for how stable your vehicle is because you can kind of roll into this slow and roll out of it slow. Um, some people turn around and come back the other way. You know, there, I've seen all kinds of stuff happening here. And, uh, but this is a great example of what, what you're kind of looking at to experience. And again, I don't know how much they can see Alex, but that lower link is still plenty out front to give, 
even at full droop, give it plenty of support that as I'm driving forward, it's not um, pulling down on the shock. Okay. Any questions there, Deb? Uh, we've got one question from Michael Abdullah, okay. 2006 Jeep Wrangler LJ going to triangulated four link in the rear on a Dana 60. Is there an advantage running an anti-rock anti sway bar setup okay. or disadvantage of having one? Okay. Um, great question and it is where we're headed. Um, I can answer this briefly now, okay? So um, over the years, everybody has um, gone from sway bar disconnects to um, what is now the rock jock anti-rock sway bar. Um, and I've got, I've got some new parts here to, to show you guys. Um, these are sway bars that you leave connected all the time and they've got a spring rate because you run one on the front and one on the rear, they kind of cancel out each other. They're very light, okay? But it helps give you some stability of the vehicle. Uh, my preference and uh, what you don't see on this vehicle is no sway bar. Um, what I like to do is get the spring rates right on the shocks so that the vehicle has a much better feel. Now, keep in mind, you can't do that on everything because we move all of our shocks and everything right out to the wheels. Like I was showing you, you know, here or here, right? So, you know, we're, we've moved all that spring and dampening control out as far as we can. Yours is currently under the frame, which is 12 inches different. Okay, so it's fine. You know, you may get a lot of flex and everything and feel good about your Jeep, but your control is way inboard. And that changes how the whole vehicle feels. So I know that there's people... Um, some of the people that are watching that have our suspensions, they can chime in and, and speak to some of this um, there online. But if you've ever driven one of these or had a chance to ride with me in one of these, it's, it's like needing glasses and you didn't even know it. It's, it's completely remarkable how different it is. Again, we're not building vehicles for high mileage or crash tests or any of that. These are built to wheel and perform um, and feel good, you know, so um, completely different than the original vehicle manufacturer had to contend with. Okay. All right. So right into sway bars, which was the next slide. Um, your factory sway bar, I don't know if you've ever looked under there, it's a bent piece of metal and it connects the two wheels with a little cheesy thing that looks like this. Um, typically, they're rubber, and uh, it's got some kind of a bolt or something to hold it. In this case, it would look like that or that. And um, these come in different lengths, right? If you put a lift kit in, you get longer ones. And uh, they make a little kit where you can pull a pin and these disconnect so um, that it allows the wheels to move a little bit more. But keep in mind, the sway bar fights the wheels. It's, it's doing exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do off-road, like the video I showed you, where you walk through something, the sway bar's fighting that, okay? So the first video, the guy probably had a sway bar on there that was way too tight, and that's why both wheels were coming up at the first time. Then you buy a newer vehicle, JK, JL, they're going to have an automatic or electronic sway bar. So this is one that with a button on your dash, you can disconnect, basically, um, this is the equivalent of a little ARB locker inside there. It's, it's electric, but you get the idea that disconnects the two halves of the sway bar. These are great. It achieves the right thing without you having to get out and try and figure it out of your Jeep. <clears throat> the downside is you go over 25 miles an hour and they reconnect and you don't realize it. And then this little box splits in half. So um, you've got to pay attention with that. The upside is the anti-rock, um, which was originally made by Curry, which is now Rock Jock. And uh, these arms come in a variety of different shapes. There's forged arms, there's all kinds of stuff now. And these are the kind that you can leave connected all the time. And uh, they come with some hardware that's at least twice, if not four times as good as this. You can see a little bit of it in the picture right there, uh, but it's much higher quality. That, will um it removes all the rubber 
and it, it's much more active and you'll notice a big difference. They, they are like six, $700 for each front or rear. So they're not exactly cheap, but it does keep you from getting out of your vehicle and reconnecting stuff um, down the road, okay? Um, the reason I don't run a sway bar is because I don't like what I describe as a sway bar whiplash, right? So this tire's trying to come up, then this one does, right? Because the sway bar's pulling it and you get this like whack. Every time you go over a rock, it's just, it, it's accentuating what's happening on the ground. So when you remove the sway bar or disconnect it, then the wheels are walking over the obstacles freely, front and rear, and the body stays level. And that's going to give you the best overall ride. The downside is if you're not very experienced wheeler and you get on an angle, you're probably gonna feel a little bit more tippy um, but a lot of that has to do with the spring rates aren't set up right. So um, there's, there's a whole bunch of other things that you can do that is correct instead of trying to band-aid it with a sway bar, okay? So um, different level, look, I, I get it, you know, and uh, $700 sway bar versus, you know, coilovers I know is a big difference. So I get it. Um, what other questions have we got, Jamie or Debbie? You're doing okay. uh, Zach Uptill asked if how how would he best go about? He'd like to go for a ride in a Genrite suspension Jeep. Yeah. So should he contact the sales guys and they can put him in touch with his closest ambassador? Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. Um, ride along. You know, ideally it would be with me if you can't get to one of the events that I'm going to. Um, mostly because what I can do is verbalize what you're experiencing. Right, so the last time we were at Trail Hero, which is our next event, what I did was the first thing we did was we took off from the booth after you got in the Jeep and I leaned over so that you could touch the ground and looked at you and said, do you feel like you're gonna roll? Nope, I don't feel like I'm gonna roll. And we just punch it and get through. And then we would go through some really rough rocks, go up a hill climb, then we'd go like a hundred across the sand dune. And then the next thing we do is hop on the street and I could show you like, look, let go of the wheel. There, this, this does it on and off road. And um, until you see that demonstrated, the, the powerful impact that has. And, and I tell people, I go, go do this same loop in your Jeep and let me know how it goes. Like they won't even get past the first like tippy spot. So um, it's, a, it's a, just a completely different animal. How, you know, I've told you guys so many times about the low center of gravity and how important that is and the fact that we run that flat belly and how that really keeps uh, our ability to keep the whole vehicle down lower um, but still have tons of ground clearance over the rocks and stuff. So, and then on top of that, the fact that I've spent so much time with King and Fox tuning the shocks, getting the spring rates right, and um, people just can't believe how nice the Jeep feels. You don't feel bottom out. You don't feel like you're getting beat up. It's just a much smoother ride. So again, I know, I know it's hard to understand and that's you know, why we always encourage you guys to get a ride. But you know, I do, um, I don't know, six, eight you know, events a year and uh, all over the country. So try and you know, hook up with me. And then typically if I'm there, you know, Kelly's there and Kelly's Tracer Jeep is completely tuned by me. Um, Jamie's got the Growler there. You know, we would typically have a bunch of different vehicles there that you can get a ride in and uh, kind of check that out. Okay. What else you got? Uh, Terry Runyon, he's the 2018 JKU. Yep. Um, is the rear elite cross member with towers able to be installed with the tub on or does the tub need to be pulled? No, that's a great question. Uh, all of our suspensions are designed for a guy to be able to do it in his garage, okay? Now, is it easier with the tub off? You bet, but you do not have to take the tub off. Um, I realize that's a giant undertaking and for somebody in their garage, you know, that's, that's probably not possible. So we do it all so that you can do it right there. Um, you might have to put it on jack stands, but you can definitely do it. Okay. What else you got? Uh, we've got a, um, a cage shock 
question. Okay. Uh, Jeff Watson, would you want to tie your shocks to the cage if your cage is tied to the body and not the frame? What are the pros and cons to connecting the cage to the body versus the frame? So, um, no, if you're going to tie your shocks to the cage, the cage has to be tied to the frame, okay? Um, and I'm not talking about like with a rubber bushing, it's gotta be hard mounted to the frame. So it can be a solid aluminum bushing or it can be just directly welded to the frame, but you've gotta have a direct connection there. Otherwise, every time your shock goes to move, it's going to be, you know, bumping the frame up based on the body mounts or the other um, not solid mounts. The, the reason why a lot of guys did that in the past was it gave them the ability to drop the height on their Jeep and just cut a, you know, three or four inch hole in the top of the fender well to get it up, you know, where they needed to get it to instead of a bigger cutout that, that we now provide a boot for. So, um, you know, six of one, half a dozen of another, Depends on how serious of a, you know, off-road dedicated rig this is. If, if it's more of something that you're driving all around, then uh, you definitely don't want to tie to the frame or to, to the cage, I'm sorry, uh, because it also translates more noise. So keep in mind, um, Alex, I don't know if you can see this, but um, on the end of a high performance shock is a heim. So this again is metal to metal. So when you put a bolt through this, any noise transmitted from the chassis, the axles, the driveline, anything is now gonna radiate up through your roll cage. So um, again, are you building a race car or are you building an all around Jeep? And uh, that's gonna make a, a difference. So you just gotta kinda decide. If you're riding a race car, typically you have a helmet on and it's got no mufflers and it's loud. So you don't hear any of that stuff. What else you got, Deb? Uh, Tammy Fisher would like to know your opinion on the three-link rear suspension. Ah, okay. So do you remember when I backed up and I told you how um, I don't like where they just run one joint right here? Well, now not only are you only running one joint here, you're also only running one joint because you've gotten rid of a whole link. And uh, typically what they do is that's not triangulated, right? So that's pulled over and then you've got a track bar. So the track bar, when the track bar cycles, it, it makes the vehicle do this movement, um, what we call the swing set, okay? And um, you can actually feel that if you're kind of remotely tuned in with your vehicle, you can feel that motion. Um, so depending on what you're doing, um, if you're doing anything high speed, that's gonna drive you absolutely crazy because you're gonna feel the chassis underneath you moving. Um, but you've got half the strength of uh, what would be a triangulated four link uh, because a track bar is only holding the rear end underneath there and it's, it's not adding much to um, the axle rocking. So um, the only reason to run a three link rear is because you're still trying to keep the gas tank here and that is not the way to do it. It needs to be moved and put in the back so you can run the flat belly. It's quarter up. You got more material you want to I, cover? I got a ton more. I'm just trying to keep okay. up with the questions. Why don't you make, keep going. Make a little more progress. Okay. Yep. All right. Keep those questions coming. I know there's more of them out there. All right. So we talked about sway bars. Now, from a terminology standpoint, I want to talk about a differential versus a third member. Okay. So this side is typical. What, what people refer to as a third member or a nine inch rear end. So this whole center section comes out and um, you can service the gears. It's actually pretty easy to work on. Um, it's a completely different design, right? This is what you probably currently have in your Jeep, at least that came from the factory, which is a cast iron differential. It's a special kind of cast iron. And um, then the carrier gets inserted inside this and then the axle shafts come in from either side and, and lock into that, okay? So um, these are the two different types. And obviously, you know, this is the same for a Dana 30, a Dana 44, a Dana 35, a Dana 60, Dana 70, Dana 80. They all are that style. The fabricated housings 
um, that you've heard of or the four nine inch style are gonna look like this, where this third member comes out. Now this particular one that we're showing you is aluminum. I can tell you that uh, if you're an off-road guy, you want the cast iron one. The aluminum one was designed for lightweight street cars and uh, it won't take long for you to destroy this, okay? Um, that's, unless there's any questions on this, I'm gonna move to the next slide. We've got a sway bar question. Okay, sure, that? I can back up on that. Uh, yep. Brett Barons, how does the rear sway bar affect rear tire tuck? It, it does. So um, a sway bar in some way, shape or form is fighting. So, so it limits your travel. Now, the sway bars come in different spring rates, okay? So the diameter of the bar that goes between the two arms is going to dictate how much resistance it gives, okay? And um, if you, you know, your factory one is very thick, you know, it's like over an inch thick. That one is going to dramatically resist flexing. And they did that so that it handles nice on the road. They don't know where you live. For all they know, you live on a canyon road and they got to make this thing handle nice, right? So um, you are trying to go off-road and do all this articulation. Well, if you take that same Jeep with that same factory sway bar and you go off-road, what it's going to do is it's going to be lifting a tire all the time. So every time this tire climbs a rock, this one's going to be in the air, in the front or rear, okay? So... Um, it just, it limits travel. It absolutely does. And as long as you understand that it's fighting the actual cycle of the suspension, then you, you've got the concept and, and that's where you're at. Okay. And we've got a video. Um, I know it's on the website and it's definitely on YouTube where I took our bow tie with no sway bar around a corner and you can see it like lean. And then I put the sway bar on and it drives like a Ferrari. So um, it makes a huge difference on road handling. So um, again, who, who's driving the Jeep? What are you doing? How fast are you going? Um, all of those things play a part in your decision and um, what you're actually doing with the Jeep, okay? No different than running a Sticky or a DOT tire or many of the other uh, decisions or choices you have to make to build your vehicle. Um, any more questions on the differential style? No. Right? Okay. All right, we're going to go ahead and keep going. Yeah. So now, this was the easiest. Um, Alex pulled this off Curry's website, but it's the easiest to understand. So this is that third member, but this applies to um, the other style differentials as well. So high pinion, if, if you're an off-road person, you want high pinion. Typically, what your Jeep comes with is low pinion, okay? So the reason low pinion is what it comes with is because the pinion runs on the proper side of the ring gear, and that gives you long life, where the, the axle will last hundreds of thousands of miles, especially if you keep fresh oil in it. But when we go off-roading, that puts the drive shaft down very low, and, uh, you know, when you think about it, you know, all the stuff that you hit with rocks, well, you're typically hitting, you know, right here on the differential. Well, that's high exposure for your rear, rear drive shaft or front drive shaft for that matter. Okay. So what we do is we do the high pinion stuff and uh, that gets, as you can see, you know, even if you're scraping on rocks and stuff down here, the drive shaft is well, well, well out of harm's way. And, and it's by a lot. So, and you can see here, Curry actually says it's 2.5, 2.25, so two and a quarter inches below center line and 2.25 above center line. So it's, it's way up there. And uh, that, that is, so if you've heard that terminology, high pinion, low pinion, this is exactly what it's talking about. It's that on the rear axle where the drive shaft connects, that is the pinion right there. Okay. Any questions on that, Deb? Uh, let's see. Caleb Abbott, what's your opinion of the newer rear JK setups for double triangulated rear, where the two upper arms are located on the rear cross member by the bumper? Oh, um, I know I saw those um, a long time ago, and it's it's a it's a counteracting system. Um, it. Um, 
it's been tried in off-road racing. There, there's been a whole bunch of these um, theories tried, but um, it's it's not quite right. What what you're really after is more of the style like we're doing, because it has to do with the drive shaft. Let me back up a couple slides. So you can see this is the output shaft of the transfer case, right? So your drive shaft would go in here. So the, the entire suspension is working around that drive shaft. And um, because we use such low gears and such high traction tires, the, the drive shaft has a slip in it. And um, you want that slip to move the minimal amount it can. If, if that's moving a lot, um, you're putting a lot more force and stress on the splines of that drive shaft. So we designed the suspension so that that has a minimal amount of movement. And when you do the suspension in this manner, you can predict or set the squat or anti-squat, okay? Where the other style doesn't do that. that that's a completely different um, theory. So um, this is tried and true. This is used on every... Pro 2, Pro 4, Ultra 4, um, Baja, you know, trophy truck. This is, this is really um, the way that you want to go for sure. Beside the fact that we're using that space back there to put your gas tank. So if you put suspension componentry back there, that space is gone. Okay, hopefully that answers the question. VB Tom, um, should we disconnect our rear sway bar for wheeling? I hardly ever see people doing that. Yes, correct. Um, the, the rear sway bar is typically a lot lighter spring rate. So um, quite honestly, the factory ones are so small that they're almost ineffective. Um, what, what happened was is uh, when you go into the dealership and somebody's looking at a spec list, and you go, oh, okay, well now I'm comparing that to a, a Range Rover or a Nissan or whatever other SUVs out there. Um, they're gonna be like, well, this one comes with a rear sway bar and this one doesn't. So they put a little piece of metal under there to say that they gave you a, a sway bar. So um, it's really very weak and ineffective. So um, you don't have to, it's certainly, a lot of people just take them off and throw them away because they're that, they, they work that little. So, and, um, by the way, when we go to these long travel systems, if you notice how much longer the arms are on the sway bar, because when the axle droops out, um, you have to make sure that this doesn't over travel. So think about this. If you had a short little arm on here, um, that could get to this level and then it'll pop and go the other way. Or if you're, you know, compressed you don't want it to go the other way so you have to be careful that this operates in the range of motion you know so look at where my fingers are you know that's that's like a 14 inch travel shock right so this is moving a lot where you know your factory suspension doesn't move very far it's it's got you know if it's four inches i'd be surprised so they they can have a very short arm if, you, if we bop back here you can see how short the little arm is on the factory one. Other way. Is it the other way? Oh yeah, it is. Come on, here we go. So there's how short the little arm is from the factory. So that's, it's probably half the length of what we're doing. And uh, you can see right there is the amount of travel. That's like three or four inches. So it's not much. Okay. What are the questions you got? Uh, Scott Pierce, so if the stock rear sway bar does that little, is it worth putting an anti-rock or just ditching it completely? Um, so that's part of what you have to try. So some of this falls on you, right? And honestly, that's part of the fun. Right? Um, I don't know about you, but I have as much fun building the Jeep as I do driving the Jeep and trying different things. Um, by the way, all you have to do is disconnect one link, right? Just, just like the sway bar disconnect. It, the other side you can leave on um, and it's, it's free floating. So um, you can try different things. 
if it's just a matter of taking out a bolt and then if you don't like it you put it back on or or you get to a super sketchy spot in the trail you still have the ability to put it back on um cord had kind of described how he how he did his they um you know and and some people they don't um wheel as often they're not as familiar with their jeep their wheelbase is much shorter you know if you're if you're talking about a jk you're going to notice it a lot less than you are on a tj right so these anti-rocks became very very popular on the shorter wheelbases and um the other thing is is that people know you know this has a lot of rubber built into it and stuff so they're really squishy um and they want something that'll react a little faster and you know, sometimes people just want a nicer quality um, item on their Jeep, too. So those are all factors in there. I'd have to know a lot more about your Jeep in order to say, you know, yeah, I just ditch that or, you know. So part of it depends on how much weight you carry as well. So if you're the kind of guy that's got tons of tools and a hard top and your tires on the roof, you need a sway bar. Okay. Tire on the roof. Well, depends on how you drive. Both tires might be up there. Uh, Zach Uphill, does your lift get rid of the track bar? It does. So only in the rear. So we talked about this on one of the previous terminologies, because if you get rid of the track bar front and rear, then you have no roll center. Okay. The track bar on the front cancels the roll center and it helps the steering work, right? Because it gives something direct to, for the steering to pull against. So I'm gonna go back so you can see it a little bit. Um, oh, that's the one. So by having the track bar here, the drag link, it, it's, it's so perfect that it's right in front of it. You can barely see it right there over the steering box. So that, that puts a direct connection between the two and makes your steering very responsive. Um, so when you go to go around a corner, you're, you're not turning the wheel going, oh, where's it going to catch, you know, like the old leaf spring days where everything was wrapping underneath. And then when it got so far, it would actually grab. This is a very direct connection. And um, again, bind free. And it's, this is a good way to go. It, it changes that roll center. This, I, I know we've talked all over the place, but what I need you to understand is that we, We've tried all the different options. We, we have settled on the best solutions and uh, you just need to like come to grips with this is the way to do it, honestly. Okay. If there was a better way to do it, we'd already be doing it. What else you got? Uh, BB Tom asked when you might be uh, making it back to the East Coast. It would certainly be um, next year before I would get back out there. Maybe next spring or summer would be the soonest that I would get back out there. And uh, if I'm gonna come out that way, I'll definitely let everybody know. We'll make a big deal of it, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be fun, so. We're caught up. We are, okay, and we're down to like the last 60 seconds, so um, if you have any last minute questions, put them in. Um, otherwise, we did pretty good today. I'm proud of everybody, because we actually made it through quite a few of the slides. And uh, of course, those Jeeps, that you see there in the pictures, you can find in our website, in the galleries. And uh, all of this stuff can be seen in our, in fact, I think we took these pictures right off the gallery or some of them. So um, we've got a lot of pictures um, of the suspension, the components on our website. And of course, remember, if, uh, if you can't catch me offline via text or email, call. I got three guys sitting over there ready to take your call. So um, we got the differentials, the different styles, right? That was pretty good. Um, the next thing was lockers. So that's what we're gonna pick up on Tuesday and cover all the different types of lockers, why you want them, why you don't, and um, what's best for you. So any last minute questions, Deb? Uh, yes. Uh, David Mork, does the Legend Kit come with axle brackets? Yes, Legend Kit does come with axle brackets. Yeah, the, the Legend kit, there, we have a base kit on the website, and then you literally click all these boxes and it just builds the, the kit for you. So you can have everything from the bare minimum 
like I'm gonna fabricate, you know, you're that guy that wants to do it all yourself to like, I want everything to show up on a giant truck with a forklift, so, including a complete rolling chassis. So you, you can get it all from us. You don't even have to have a frame. You don't even have to have a Jeep. You can just start and, and get everything you want, so. All right. Miles McKenna, you talked about roll cages a while back, but when is your JT cage coming out? Oh. <laughs> well, we're, we're just about done with our JL cage, and then JT would be next. So um, I'm going to say, why don't you look for that right around the first of the year? We, we've got we've to finish up on the JL stuff, and then I'll be on that JT stuff. So. Thanks for asking, that's a good question. Brett Barron said, "Don't please don't forget about my scrub radius question from Tuesday, offline answer. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Okay. I know a lot of people have been messaging me, so yeah. I'm sorry if I'm not getting back to everybody as prompt as I'd like to, but I'm, I'm working on it, so. All right, okay. I think that's it. Yeah. We're gonna wrap it up and we'll see everybody back here on Tuesday. Mm -hmm.